fruit of the spirit the gift of the spirit is coming your way in the name of Jesus and say in the name of Jesus Hallelujah and our God is a good God our God is a wonderful God our God is a faithful God our God is a God that never changes our God is a God that never let go our God is a God that is always working with us our God is a God who knows our name hallelujah go with your mutual link of the way nor what's ever calibrate you but you know what's ever calibrate I also have a testimony I have to tell you this our God is a faithful God our God is a God that never let us down o ka re di gwedi tshe fitileng ke bolela sepedi jo no ne ke dusha o no de ba tshepedi ba for du khambo remeni ne ke diang ne ke dusha nga tshe venda tshashu office ya ila ore ba bithu ba bili bono fana ba dzule mudini muthi bono de ba tshe venda ba for du khambo remeni swa ila kuno ba no bo fana ba tsama ndawoni yinwe hi tshe venda tsha kaina a mara faka makaranisa so fana swa ku nwana bo tshama ba re ba mbeni ba tle ba bebula ba re ba mbeni eh swi ngona ka ngwina swi nga endleka ma swi bona ane re u ra vuli uli na ikati ya hala if it ya echo ku nna le lena ha pe ke kuku ah ah eh ah le na le motsebi tsho ah this It means things that happen according to the way of men. They don't happen according to the way of God. If God says yes, nobody can say no. If God say the door has been opened, nobody can close it. Hallelujah. Which I'm telling you fully when or it's your time. Mudi mwar na wa khona nke. Ah na re ko bona zwone mudzimba khoita bona mudzimba khoita zwulana a re nda fumulai ndi do bando roba na ndi bo ah ndi do bando roba zwa ku kuma bona kezwe ha tiri ba ba tshibona na bangwa dzana ba ri na dzikhundudzo yo bhanda zwino dzobera ngo nani dzo dzura dzo dzura nga pfanelo zwe zwino madubanya na sima a ri tendi nga manda kha zwithu zwulana madubanya na sima nga nani do bona vhe ndi penyo Jipeiri tere ne fesa sate na chirizi vito na chirizi aye ye aleluya aleluya bone bone ba to daba dia nende kwamba zwanga i'm speaking my own isn't it phela ngo ngoko mina ano monga khulu ha ubuhle ubuhle nje bathu ngoko eh mangifike ekhlini nje ngoko bona baya khuluma abantwana nangu koko bwile so mangiphume ekuseni ngingena ngapha ngingena ngapha bese ngathi ngihamba ngise isuntwe ukoko lo bona usikanzukela ke kukwabana akire haleluya no i don't want to take time i just want to wake up waken up your spirit you know i love god i love god i love god with all my heart what god thought it will never happen has happened When somebody was saying no God was saying yes. When somebody was saying the door has been closed God was saying it has been opened. Hallelujah. So we are going to find a worshiping song just a small worshiping song we'll raise our hands we close our eyes we take our hands unto the Lord the devil will be coming to the front. Tell us what God want us to hear today because we are here in the house of the Lord because the Bible said so. Akere. Let us lift our hands to the almighty God. Sweet Jesus sweet Jesus 
What a wonder you are You are brighter Than the morning star You
Jesus and God. is the name of Jesus. Amen. You can sit down. Amen. Ask your neighbor, are you happy to be here? And your neighbor say what? Your neighbor, you say what? Yes. Uh, I'm very happy we have uh, our pastor here. Pastor Chappie, you can stand up. We clap hands for you. And, uh, thank God. Maybe we're supposed to be sitting somewhere there. You go and sit somewhere there. Or go and sit on my seat. Go and sit on my seat. Yes. There. Yes. God bless. Clap, clap hands for him. Amen. I was very touched. It's really painful to see what the church has become whereby always we have to be like this, where we cannot trust each other. So you could see what the church has become. It's so painful. You know, when I went on the other side, I could just say, oh God, this is really, this is not your church. This is not your church. And then, you know, in Charisse, we have been telling you what God was telling us. We thank God that pastors of Charis, they hear from God. They really hear from God. And then today, I just said, despite that some of you have watched that, I just want us to play this thing that, you know, it must tell you something. I think you can write notes out of that. What is the cause of Corona? What causes Corona? Can I tell you this? The moment when people who are supposed to call God for the nation keep quiet, something wrong must happen. Mm -hmm. Then the moment when people who are supposed to call God, you remember the Bible says, my people, if they humble themselves and go and pray, I will hear them from above. So the moment, you know, those people, when they are quiet, we have to face disaster. This disaster is here, it has come to, to open our understanding. To 
open our understanding concerning the church. If truly you can see the day I was telling you on 14 May, 14 May, I was not happy at all. But let's play that message. You will see that if we have a prophet in Charis, he must hear from God. Right now we have got Mama, we have Andres. These people, they hear from God. If they speak, let's obey God. So this is a sign of saying, truly, are we crying for our nation? Are we really crying for our nation? What will happen if God can leave us? The church today is a joke. Some of you, uh, you know, on, if you can check there, that, that saying was saying, the church will be closed. But if you can listen to some words there, I went to listen, I was shocked. I was, I was really shocked. The first thing was, you see, the titles. People are left with what? With titles. They're not calling God. People have reached where they want to reach. If you reach where you want to reach and you don't call God, what will happen with people? Today, no one respects church today. And I remember that time I was going around and say, you're going to have a question. Why are you a Christian? Why do you go to church? Others say, I go to worship. Who will tell you? I go to worship church. To in church, you can worship God everywhere. Can you just play it for, for, a, for a while? Listen to that. I want to say it again, what I was saying here. The problem we have made, we are left with titles without Christ. The more the church becomes big, you're an apostle or bishop. And the scriptures there, a bishop must be a person who's married. We have got children who are obedient to him. The bishop there was not a wife there. Was a person who have a wife. There's no bishop who is a woman there. Look here, today we are full of scriptures. You're an apostle, you have never traveled. You are local and you are lacking. <laughs> How can you be an apostle who have never traveled? Because apostle means God sent. It's not something special. It's God sending you. You have never gone anywhere. You're an apostle. You're a prophet. The fulfillments of your words determine you. The Bible says we must not fear you if you speak things that does not come to pass. In other words, a prophet must be feared. You remember by the time of Samuel, eh? when he goes to where Jesse was staying, Everybody was trembling. I said, the man of God is here because God wants to speak. He must be feared because he speaks things that will happen. A prophet must come here and say, there will be a rain this week and it's a disaster, so we need to make sure that our houses must be okay. Or he must come to you and say, brother, you are going to die. And, uh, I mean, you're going to die. <laughs> a pastor is a guider of your spiritual level. He must teach you to grow, how to work with God. Same applies to it. That's what a pastor is a teacher. It's one thing just to guide you, to teach you,
Today we are left with what? Titles. When I grew up, I was attending a church where people wear clothes with a cross at the back. Another one just looked and said, this cross, it seems to be small. I will get my own big. Next week, you find that he's wearing a big jacket with a big cross at the back. And then when we danced, we used to, you must, you must see the cross. See the cross, but there was no cross. Cross has done nothing to us. We are left with titles. Even Christians now, they just go to church. Number one, they are going to solve their problems. Today, if you don't have a problem, you don't go to church. That's why today we have got leaders who are not called. Because they have seen that it's a solution to their career. I mean, if I do it like this, I'm trying to work my job and I can't get money. Ah, people are becoming pastors and get money. Let me be a pastor. Others, they go to Bible school. That's why there are Bible schools everywhere. To be a pastor. From there, recruiting people. I am a prophet. To bring you. Now, you don't know Christ, you know the prophet. So this thing, we need to change it. How we need to pray. To pray for God's intervention. I don't know if you're hearing me. We need to pray for God's intervention whereby when I'm a pastor, if I look at my worship team, yeah, I must say, no, I cannot accept sin there. I'm sure you're hearing me. I must look at my ashes. I must look at my ashes. What are they ushering? The Bible says the ashes must be filled with the Holy Spirit. Stefano was part of ushers who were filled by the Holy Spirit. Okay, let's choose people who will be ushers. They were seven. All of them were filled by the Holy Spirit. Because demons will enter from, move from here and enter to this one just like that. Our church today is a joke. Very soon, this church is here, will be closed. Very soon. Because we were talking about this, you see this, you see that. Very soon, you, for you to go to church, you'll be confused. Already there are many people who are confused here. Because the day you found that this man is not the man of God, you were thinking. I've been saying this to you. It's not true. I've been telling you. The day you just come here, ah, I didn't know this man. And you realize you gave him a lot of money. You will fail now to give in the church because of what you did there. The, the day you realize that ah, the person bless you, and this person was not living a right life. I'm telling you, you people here, you don't pray. That's why today our church is a joke. Witches are here, sitting in the church. I mean, they are doing nothing. Witches now, they are in the church now. We don't know whether you are, you are, you are satanist or what. Satanists are around now. Others are saying amen. Others are leaders in the church, satanists. Witchcraft. Others people are smoking. They are singing with the baritone in the chair. Oh, 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 a cigarette. Everything is mixed up. And Jesus is coming back. So this is something that I don't believe in this gospel of. I'll come to you and say, ah, how can you become rich? Ah, and I teach you about how to become rich. Number one. Number one is make sure that you, you, you stand like this. Number two, you must wash your two teeth. This in front. This one. Don't wash all if you want to wake up. You, this three, you concentrate here. Number three, the way you present yourself. You must, you must walk in a way that you are showing you, you are selling a, a portfolio. Your, your clothes. Even your hands must be like this. Now people will, will come to church. 
No Holy Spirit. Lies everywhere. People are sick today. And some people here, you know, God gave them a grace to be prayed for so that they live. And these are the people we are playing with them. Before God, what are we going to say? Before God. We are a ministry of bearing people. We are, now we are a ministry of bearing people. As long as we can get money from them. Get money from them. So this is the time that all of us here, you are hearing, we go back to our drawing board, we sit, am I a Christian? You ask number one question, why I go to church? Why do I call myself Christian? These two questions are important. Why do you go to church? Let me ask some people. Why do you go to church? Now? To seek for my salvation. To seek for my salvation. Why are you Christian? Because I love Jesus. Because I love Jesus. You see, somebody just said, ah, very soon you will hear that question. Come. Why do you go to church? To worship God. Very soon. Going to church, you will be criticized everywhere. So now, you people here, you will hear the issue of going to church. Are you going to church? I still go to church. You hear that? So why do you go to church? And why are you Christian? Because you can see the leaders. God is making them to know, don't trust in leaders, trust in me. And people will be talking on the other side. Why do you go to church? I'm obeying God's word. See, this one, Stella, this one has answered me right. Why do you go to church? I'm obeying God's word. You must be able to say, it's part of my obedience. Going to church for me, it's not because I, I'm going to worship God. I can worship God everywhere. Even in my room, I worship God, isn't it? Even, even the restroom, I'm going to church because it's part of my obedience in the word. The Bible says I must not forget to meet where others meet. It's not true. So you people here, you're going to be questioned about that. You see going to church as useless. That persecution that is written in the Bible will come now. Will come to extend that you are. Ah, church closed, church closed, church closed, church closed, church closed, church closed. Pastors arrested. Many things will happen. Very soon, even yourself say, ah, me? Oh, so it's it's about to happen. Amen. Hallelujah. This is a serious message for all of us. Where the going to church and the Christian life. If you can see uh, when that man was sitting there. Can you pray when the man was using his hands without feeling me? When he calls you hands like this, pray. When he's doing like this, if you feel it in your prayer life, your heart life, you know, pray when he's using your hands. Thank God. Thank God that we will never hear that scripture is put any sign. Pastor Charles, if you have done prayer, speak in my heart. It will never happen. That pastor will just say, please stay home. Before you meet with the pastor, go to the Pastor Charles. Because we are afraid to meet him. Think about it when you find that the, the Pastor Charles and you are doing something wrong. I don't want to hear that. He will to accept him. He will not even preach the truth. Preaching the truth. So I just pray that what what whoever that man was doing is because you can hear that man was very sad. Was very very sad. If you if you are going to show him, don't criticize. Tell him to show him love. If you can have this thing before you met him, before you met him. Now we are not having time. No one.
So you people here, you're going to be questioned about that. You see going to church as useless. That persecution that is written in the Bible will come now. Will come to extend that you ah, church close, church close, church close, church close, church close, church close, pastors arrested. Many things will happen. Very soon, even yourself say, ah, me? Oh, so it's a lot of it's about to happen. Amen. Hallelujah. This is going to be serious. We read the mass. And our notes must close. This is my prayer. Today, after preaching, I want us to pray the prayer of seeking you. And also asking for forgiveness for our nation's Islamic agenda. Amen. I believe God is going to help us. Are you hearing that prayer? We, we need to pray together that prayer to ask God. The Muslim was, the other man was seeking us because there will be something like this. Something like this. And it is something like this. It's also very good for me. Also helps for me. That is why I, when I went to see God, I said, Let's expose if God sees. If God sees, not when God has not seen. I didn't say we must not expose. I said if God sees, because if God sees, He knows how He's going to heal and bring that on His church. Amen. So I am praying that after this service today, we pray and send the help to the church which is needed for them. The Bible says when Peter was arrested. This church came to him and prayed. He was arrested. I believe there are some people that God wants to release in our generation to make it for this time. To make it for this time. Amen. I'm already seeing that that is very tough to be a pastor this time. People who are seeing that. Can you ask pastor? Can you be mindful and tell us how tough it is to be a pastor? I will ask also can you just when you are listening to me how tough it is to be a Christian and people who should God bless you so much as well it is like the time where uh, Jesus was once again saying to me not as a nation but also as a holy Lagos because people are now saying where are, we, where are the pastors who said they are healed where are uh, prophets, where are apostles, where are evangelists? But now, yes, it is difficult for the servants of God because so they are healed, but we are being exposed. Not because we cannot uh, uh, manage, uh, uh, you know, the persecution. But now, this is influencing even Christians that are faithful unto God, not to do their, you know, ordinances, not to take care of the church of God. It's very difficult for us, many servants of God, because right now, many servants of God are even, you know, thinking if, if not some of the year, even beginning to go to church, start their jobs. It is very difficult for the servants of God. Uh, 
Israel said to use the first December as uh, our mission day. There's nothing that can prevent us from Israel to reach out to that many parts of the world. There's so many. Did you hear that because I heard that too? Because I think in the church, through the church you speak, you have to pay for this too. You have to pay for people on TV. You have to pay for some people who ask us to even pray. And we have money for other people. So now it's difficult when you find that people are still going with their money. That's why I'm going to say that, that it's going on the other side of saying, you know, we are, we are channeled, but the channel, that's it, only channel, you know, and then now you cannot run everything. And uh, the same applies to Christians. Let's get one Christian. It's now difficult to be a Christian because of social media also. We become confused when we go to Facebook or any more social media. We see someone exposing someone, someone doing this to someone. And the same people are just uh, so we, we become confused. We don't know what to do anymore. It's so difficult. So we need to be in the shadow of your Christ and God. Yes, thank you. Let's clap and sing for us. I think a couple of times we have printed the concern Facebook. You can go there. If you don't have something, Facebook. You can use the option of Facebook. You can picture like this. You do like this because of Facebook. You are into it. Yes, because of Facebook. Automatically, you are going to hear another pastor saying this. Another one saying this. But uh, what you see is a very sad thing. How do you know this man is what you are hearing there? You find that he has given him a lot of money. So now you need to trust God. I think that's what you see. So God must help us when we pray that uh, you know, just in this time when we go to the world, thank you, Prophet Shaku, and thank you, uh, uh, Sister Nkrum. Thank you. Let's open First uh, John chapter 5 from verse 10. First John chapter 5 from verse 10. It says, the one who believes in the Son of God, who adheres to, trusts in, and relies confidently on Him as Savior, has the testimony within Himself. Thank you. Because He can speak authoritatively about Christ from His own personal experience. And the one who does not believe God in this way has made out to be, has made him out to be a liar because he has not believed in the evidence that God has given regarding his son. I just want us to check that verse. Okay, 11. And the testimony is this God has given us eternal life. We already possess it, and this life is in his son, resulting in our spiritual completeness and eternal companionship with him. He who has the son, by accepting him as Lord and Savior, has the life that is eternal. He who does not have the son, by personal faith, does not have the life. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord for this word in Jesus name amen today i want to teach you about faith but not in a way that you know faith i want to teach you just write faith is a lifestyle faith living life of faith just write living living by faith it's a lifestyle yes living by faith is also a lifestyle. A lifestyle. When I was reading this, I found that 
God wants us to trust Him. And you cannot trust God unless there are promises. You cannot trust God unless there are promises. It's only when He fulfills promises, one or three, four in your life, you begin to trust Him. There's no trust without promise. There's no promise without trust. Let's call it that way. And then if you look at this verse that I want us to look, which is very important for me, is verse 10. It says that he who believes in the Son of God uh, and relies confidently on him. In other words, your reliance to God will be challenged. If you believe in God, everybody can believe or believe in the Son of God. But here it says, and rely confidently in Him. It says, as a Savior. The moment when it says, as a Savior, it's telling you that Savior in all areas of your life. Savior when you're sick. Savior when you want something. Savior in your soul or for your soul. If you reach where your confidence is established on that line, automatically you will have a personal experience with him. Personal experience of living by faith with him day by day. To extend that living by faith becomes a habit. I don't want to talk about this one that says the one who does not believe, I mean, he made him a liar. Automatically, yes, it means he cannot fulfill his promises. If we don't believe in him, we make him a liar that he speaks what he cannot do. So, if truly we want to make faith or living by faith our lifestyle, we need to understand that is the Savior. And we have confidence in Him. That's the first thing that we need because I want to speak many things. And look at verse 11. And the testimony is this. God has given us what? Eternal life. That is the testimony. Testimony of a car, of a house, you know, is of this place. This is, uh, you know, a primary testimony. We have primary testimony. Listen, even if those testimonies are not existing, God is still God. If you can see here, the Bible says, the testimony is, he has given us what? Eternal life. And it says, the life is in the Son, resulting in a spiritual completeness. Therefore, if we live by faith in his Son, we become complete in God. God wants us to be complete in him, whereby we cannot be shaken. We become what he wants us to be. We need to reach a level where life of faith, it becomes our lifestyle. Living by faith becomes our lifestyle, whereby we know that there is nothing that we need, we need to use except to have faith in him. So I was reading this, I was shocked. I'm reading the last verse that I want to talk about. He who has the Son, by accepting Him as Lord and Savior, has life. So the moment when you accept Christ, that lifestyle, that life, the lifestyle, there's a life that God wants you to live. Amen. I said there's a life that God wants you to live. Amen. It's not a life of failure. It might be lives with patience because you are waiting for the promises of God to come to pass. You know, this brings you to have a fruit of patience. A fruit of patience because you have got a lifestyle whereby you always wait for God. God's time to you is always the best. You don't want to rush God. You don't want to jump up and conclude 
in any situation, you believe that God is the ultimate. If he's not doing it now, he'll do it tomorrow. If he's not doing it tomorrow, he'll do it next week. And therefore, you cannot complain. Amen. So, when I was looking at this, I found that faith is our lifestyle. When people have to come closer to us, they must realize that our reliance is in him because we trust on what he said. What he has promised will come to pass. You know, one of our challenges today is, you know, we don't have personal experience with him. This all sums up to bring out a personal experience with him. If you know that he has done this, you will do another thing. If you wait on one, you will wait in all. If you have got patience with him on one, you will have patience with him in all. That is why when David approached Goliath, he says, no, I've killed the bear. So even this one, I can kill it. So this is a personal experience in our lives. Amen. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7. It says we walk by faith, not by sight. Living our life in a manner of consistent with our confidence beliefs in God's promises. We live a life in a manner that when people look at us, we are constant. We are not fluctuating. If truly faith becomes your lifestyle or you live by faith, you live in a manner that always you won't be shaken. When things hit you, they still find you are the same person. Yeah, God is not telling you that your faith will always bring results. It's, also, it's telling you that you must be constant and take him as God, as he is. He who comes to God must believe he's God. He is the one who will decide to award you on the faith you are using. So, what is the meaning of we walk by faith? It means we live by faith. It means we move forward by faith. It means without faith we cannot move. If you always live by looking at other people. It is possible you will find, you'll find yourself living the life of other people. In other words, faith is the only key that makes us to live the life we are destined for. The, the life that you are created for. I'm created to preach. Even when I'm quiet, I'm preaching. Even when I'm quiet, I'm preaching. So I, I cannot preach only when I'm on the altar. I'm always constant. If you're with me and you're doing something, I will tell you, this is wrong. You're not part of me. So God wants us to be constant in doings of everything around us. Amen. So we must not say, we walk by faith. I don't walk by sight, meaning that because you are looking at the promise and you say, oh, now I've got a challenge. Tomorrow, you change. Your life must be constant. Before you pray, check your life. Before you tell him something, you want to move the mountain by faith, check your life. If, are you constant? Is there anything that is affecting you and you find that the lifestyle you are living now is another one. Does not correspond with what you believe in. Romans 8. Let's read Romans 8, 22, Mama, uh, verse 22. Ask your neighbor, how is your lifestyle? And your neighbor say what? Is it constant or you are fluctuating? Today you are light, tomorrow you are black. Can you read verse 22? It says, For we know that the whole creation has been mourning together as in the pains of childbirth until now. 23. And not only this, but we too who have the first fruits of the Spirit, a joyful indication of the blessing 
to come. Even we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the sign of our adoptions as son. The redemption and transformation of our body at the resurrection. I want to speak something to you which is very, very important that can make your Christ, Christian life meaningful. We are not determined by the results of our faith now. We have hope. And our hope is Christ. We have hope there. We know that when we are remaining constant here, anything can still happen you know, to tell us that we are false here. But what makes us to remain the way we are is because we have already tested the joy that is coming. There is joy that is coming. Amen. So, whatever comes your way must not affect your lifestyle. It must not affect what? Your lifestyle negatively. Maintain it. Maintain your lifestyle as a child of God. That life of faith. Because you've got hope. Even if you want to get a blessing now. Even if you want to get a blessing now. But there's a blessing that is coming. You know, I was reading this in Hebrews. Just read Hebrews 11. Maybe it will make sense when we, we read it here. We read from verse 13. Hebrews 11, yes. I don't care what is said, but we have hope. I might be losing a job here, but I have hope with Christ. Look at these people, they had hope. Verse 11, it says what? Verse 13. Hebrews 11, verse 13 to 16, yes. All these died in faith, guided and sustained by it, without receiving the text tangible fulfillment of God's promises only having seen anticipated them and having welcomed them from a distance and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth now those who say such things make it clear that they are looking for a country of their own and if they had been thinking of that country from which they departed as their true home they would have had they would have had a continuing opportunity to return but the truth is that they were longing for a better country that is a heavenly one for that reason God is not ashamed of them or to be called their God, even to be surnamed their God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for he has prepared a city for them. So you can see that this is a lifestyle that we need to follow. Lifestyle. Look at the life of Abraham. All of them, they were taken to another land out of where they were born. And the Bible says, all these Christians, they died in faith. Seeing what God has promised. Died believing that truly God can give us what he has promised. But the Bible says, to show that it was tough, they didn't receive. The Bible says they had opportunity to return back from where they were they had opportunity to return back, but they knew that there is a heavenly home. It's as good as I'm coming from Venda, where I come from, and I'm in Johannesburg when it's tough. People from home will say, come back home. Come back home. So I say, no, whatever that is making me here to be poor here cannot affect me or stop me to where I'm going. We need to reach that level where we have got this kind of lifestyle that whatever you are going through now here cannot make you to turn back to where you come from. Because you know your destiny is heaven. 
Your destiny is not here. Look here, I can give you an example. You get cars, you get houses, you get whatever, you get whatever. You will leave them here. If truly you just want to have everything here, it is possible you have all here without living your life. You can still have all here without living your life here and you miss home. So your lifestyle in Christ makes God to make you to live the life he has created you for. There's a life that God, he will never allow you to die. He will never allow you to die without, you know, writing something about your life. He will never. I can give you an example about from, you know, because normally we talk faith from Abraham. But look from Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. When Abel began to realize, oh, God is God. He must be given the best. And the Bible says, even when he was dead, his blood speaks. But look, there's a lesson there. The Bible says, Cain was educated by God there. And God says, Cain, why are you so sad? If you do what is right. But if you do what is wrong, sin is close to you. If we don't live life of faith, we will always carry out sin. But though God spoke with Cain, he could not change. He went forward and killed his brother. Though we are hearing the message of faith, we carry on and do what is wrong. You can just look there, what happened there. You will realize that there is a lesson in our lives today. If we realize he is God, we will give him what is due to him, like what Abel did. But now, what we are crying for is this house, is that car, is that money, is that what? And all these things, very soon, we won't have them. All these things that you have to see and touch are of the flesh. What about your soul? So if you reach that level, you realize that I must develop a lifestyle living by faith. Amen. Tell, tell your neighbor, I want to live by faith. Can you tell your neighbor, I want to live by faith. That is your lifestyle. That is your lifestyle. What makes you today to be very weak in the Lord is because you have not reached that life. You have not reached that life. Let me give you an example of what happened by the time of Genesis. I can take you back there. Maybe if we can read uh, Genesis. Yeah, let's check Genesis uh, 5, verse 21. You see one man there. This man, I'm just talking about these people because I feel they teach us lesson from Genesis 5, 21 to 24. Read for us, Mama. When Enoch was 65 years old, he became the father of the Methuselah. Enoch walked in habitual fellowship with God 300 years after the birth of Methuselah and had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years and in reverent fear and obedience Enoch walked with God and he was not found among men because God took him away to be home with him to be home with him tell somebody say you don't have a home here we don't have a can home you, here can you tell us you don't have a home here you don't have a home here can you hear what, what happened with Enoch? This might be the people who have encouraged Abraham. These are the people that have encouraged Abraham. Our father, Abraham. Because the Bible says he walked, look here, in verse 23, uh, 30, 32, uh, this amplified Bible, he says, he walked in habitual fellowship with God. And, and then, yes, he walked in habitual fellowship with God 300 years after the birth 
of Methuselah and had also sons and daughters. And then I want to tell you about what happened to Methuselah. Methuselah, uh, when he was born, he also learned something. We learn from our parents. Methuselah lived 969 years. Methuselah lived. Methuselah is, is a child of Enoch. He might have walked and said, hey, I saw what happened to my father. God took him. No one buried him. And then him, he said, no, even myself. This is the lifestyle of our family. Methuselah gave birth to Lamech. And Lamech gave birth to Noah. And Noah is the one that, you know, he lived with God also. He lived with God. This was a generation who has learned from their fathers. Amen. And they had lifestyle. Look what happened to Noah. You know, it was not easy for Noah to stand up and say, the waters are coming. People in that time, they knew seasons. But he stood up to say, hey, there are waters that are coming. They will destroy all the... I mean, this man, for him to convince his family to end up and stand together to build the ark was not easy. To say, God told me that the whole world is only us. If we can build this, it won't... It was, I don't know. That was the reason now today. We have got families and we have got children who disobey us. Because it's not easy. How can you say to a child who's going to, to school, who knows that there's a raining season? Who knows that there is summer and winter? And you are saying the rains will rain until the whole world is full. And you say, God say we must build the ark. Automatically the preaching there was shameful. And this man stood his grounds. He knew where he came from. They built a generation because a lifestyle living by faith brings out a generation of faith. If you want to have a generation of faith, start a lifestyle of living by faith. You will have a generation of living by faith. Amen. If truly you want to see, your children are watching you. Are watching you. Sometimes you bring a song on. And some mamas, they make sure that, you know, when they come to the house, ah, they say they are coming to strengthen the house, but they bring razor to everybody, even to your child. So your child might not be happy to see his blood or her blood when they do incisions. They might not be happy. But they begin to question you, ah, why razor and who's this person? If, if our parents are here, so same applies to what happened to this generation of Methuselah, of this man, Enoch, that God took him away, Methuselah, Lamech, there comes Noah. What happened to them? They knew that, oh God, here is existing, so we must have faith in him. Amen. We need to have faith in him. Hallelujah. If we read Genesis 6, 5 to 9, you found the Bible says, Noah found grace in the eyes of God. This is the time that we must not make grace cheap. We must never make grace cheap. It's when you are denying evil. It's when you are teaching your children the right thing. We must not just say, God will give me grace. God will give me grace. No, your lifestyle must, must show. And God will give you grace. When God look around, he must choose you. Amen. He knows your heart. He knows what you are crying for. You are crying that your children have to serve God. You are crying that you must serve God with fullness or with all your power. And as you are doing that, automatically God will give you grace. Grace is not cheap. It's not something you wake up. All the people that have found favor, like Maria or Mary, all those people, you know, they were living a right life. So this is the time that if we are living a life of faith, we must make sure that we make that life our lifestyle. Amen. 
I want us now to go to our father, Genesis 12, from verse 1 to 4. Just read, Mama, uh, our father now, Abraham. Here he was called Abraham. We have read this several times. Now in Haran, the Lord has said to Abram, Go away from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I show you. And I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you abundantly and make your name great, meaning exalted and distinguished. And you shall be a blessing, a source of great good to others. And I will bless, meaning do good for benefit of those who bless you. And I will curse that is subject to my wrath and judgment. The one who curses and despises and dishonors as contempt for you. And in you, all the family, meaning nations of the earth, will be blessed. So Abram departed in faithful obedience as the Lord had directed him, and Lord his nephew left with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he left Haran. The reason why I want us to read here is because of... Abraham's nephew. Abraham's nephew. Abraham's nephew, uh, Lord, was not understanding the whole lifestyle. And you must know that Abraham existed after Noah. And then after Noah, God said the age must be reduced to 120. And here the Bible says he was 75. It means he was very old. That time, you are 300 years, you still walk like a boy. That time. You, are, you still walk like a boy. But this time now, after God said that, you are 75, you have to walk, you need someone. So he wanted someone who can take over the lifestyle that he knows and teach him. Because he, ne he never had a son. There was no child. There were only servants. And the Bible says, uh, he took his nephew. We see that on Genesis 13, verse 8. If you can read from verse 8, that the Bible says, their servants began to fight. When the servants began to fight, we found his nephew. They began to quarrel. And Abraham called his nephew. Here you could see that it was the nephew who was supposed to have gone to Abraham. How can an older one call a younger one? The younger one was supposed to have said, Baba, we have a problem. These people here, can we chase them or reprimand them? They are fighting now. And now the older one came and said, My nephew, I know where God took me. You and me, we are not supposed to fight because of these animals and people who are taking care of the animals. So, I bid you, can you choose the land? Because the land is so big around here. Choose where you can go. Look what Lot did. He looked at the side of Gomorrah and he found it was green. And he looked on the other side, it was like a desert. Because he, he didn't know the lifestyle, that the lifestyle... You know, it's not determined by the outside. It is determined by the inside. If now you judge places by outside, you are affected. Tomorrow you will cry. The Bible shows that, you know, he chose the watered land. And he went on the other side. And from there, Abraham, when he turned, God began to speak with him. And say, Abraham, my promises will come to pass. Amen. So this is the time that we need to know that it's not what is outside that determines what God is doing. It's not outside that determines the plans of God. If your, your lifestyle is from inside, you can change the environment. 
You can change the situation. You can go to a dry place and you find that it's no longer a dry place. You can start a small thing and it will multiply. If we carry on looking around, we'll end up joining wrong people. We'll end up joining wrong people. We'll be end up attracted by the people who are about to perish. When he reached that side, he found that the people of Sodom and Gomorrah were wicked. What about his children? What about his servants? Look, when God saved him, he was saved alone with his family. Where were the servants? It means they have joined there. This is the time that we look at our lifestyle. Amen. And lifestyle of faith is very wonderful life. Hebrews 10, verse 32. Can you read verse 32? Hebrews 10, verse 32. But remember the earlier days when after being spiritually enlightened, you patiently endured a great conflict of suffering. You hear that verse? The moment when you are enlightened by the truth for you to obey that truth, they have to be suffering. Christianity here was not promising us, you know, a bread with peanut butter. Yeah. The moment when your eyes are open, your friends will leave you. Your family won't understand you. Because God wants you somewhere. God is searching for you somewhere. He wants all the wrong people to go. No one must beat his chest and say, I'm the one who did that to you. No one must never. You know, when I'm speaking like this, I wanted to tell you people who are waking uh, that uh, your job, the job that you're doing now, you're not doing it by faith. But out of the job, what you're going out of that job is what? It's faith. Because you believe you can do this. You believe, so out of the job. So don't look at this job. I don't know if you're hearing me. Because the moment when your eyes are lightened, you got a job now. And now you begin to see what you can do. You see the place of God upon your life. Satan will attack you. So that those things that you are thinking, those things that you are planning with God, will never come to pass. I want to tell you they will come to pass in the name of Jesus. So devil knows very well. He can open you. He can open everything to you. But he will stop the process of a good lifestyle. Because he knows very well that with that lifestyle, you know, you are going to prove to the world. You are going to prove to your relatives that he's able. God doesn't want you to fail. But devil is blocking you. So you maintain yourself, amen. Just maintain that lifestyle. Read that verse again, 32, Mama. Being, but remember the earlier days when after being spiritually enlightened, you patiently endured a great conflict of suffering. Remember the early days. Remember even your Christian life. Because many of us, we are no longer those Christians we were when we start. There was joy in us of moving forward with patience. It was like tomorrow there will be end of the world. Have you ever find that? You just say, if, we, if it ends here, I'm going to heaven. But today you just say, hey, it must not come to an end. I still have plans. So in that time when you were enlightened, Satan was attacking. Every knowledge you receive that will open your eyes, it will bring Satan to attack you. If truly that plan, that weight, that direction is to make you to be what God wants you to be, don't ever think it will be easy. Even Paul says, you know, 
God has opened doors, but there are many adversaries. The moment when God opened doors, adversaries will come. So don't forget, devil wants you to live this kind of life. You must stop this kind of life. In fact, he can't come and tell you, stop. But he will use pressures. He will use people you love most so that you must stop. Can you just read the following verse, Mama? Sometimes by being made a spectacle, publicly exposed to insult and distress, and sometimes by becoming compassions with those who were so treated. Sometimes uh, you can be exposed in a way that you even ask yourself, are they talking about me or someone else? A public spectacle. In public, they, you are insulted. You know what the Bible says? Jesus spoke about it in Matthew 5, 5 verse 11 and 12. That if you are being insulted, rejoice. There's a joy in heaven. If you are ridiculed, rejoice. There's a joy in heaven. In other words, it means it shows that you are, you are on the right track. So here we are not promised anything better here. You have to be insulted. People have to hate you. But your lifestyle of faith, you carry on holding. Ridiculed. Family must leave you. You have to reach a point. If people have not called you a witch, you're not a Christian. People must reach a point where they call you, you're a witch. Others, they have to look at you, you're a witch. Why are you, why are you the one who's prospering alone? Why are you the one? Because you're going to prosper in front of them. So why are you alone? Your, your things will be opened up. They will question what others will be competing you. And you don't even know. Others, you give them money, they go to some of us. That is why, you know, you have to reach a level where you understand that everyone is affected when you are living a life of faith around you. You affect them positively and negatively. There's no one who just come to say, everything is fine, this man is very good. No, some people are talking. Everyone is talking. You are sending out the message. I don't know if you're hearing that. If you're here, say I hear. So this is the time that when you live a life of faith, you are not quiet, listen. Because even when you are keeping quiet, the car that you'll be driving, that car you'll be driving will be saying, this man is having money. And whereas you know you are managing, you are living by faith. You are not living, you are, you are managing. Amen. Amen. So I pray that this faith you are having will grow and will move mountains in Jesus' name. When I was reading this verse, I was saying, God, can you help us when we face a public spectacle? When they make us public spectacle, insulted, and you find that we still find peace to maintain the right atmosphere around us. Have you ever find that someone injured you or insulted you and is happy about that? Many people, they are not doing it because they want. But devil is searching for what is inside you. And you will never find it. Amen. So carry on with your lifestyle. It will pay off. I say it will pay off. I say it's about to pay off. The moment when you see rejection, that is celebration. The moment when you see your stagnation, that is breakthrough for you. You need to carry on pressing, pressing. You carry on pressing. Do you know what the Bible says? When Paul says, it's not that I've apprehended, I press on. Paul was not saying it was easy. He was saying I press. What is the meaning of press? It means it was not easy. There are times when you are home, you say, I feel like I can't go to church. This is tough. This is what? But you press. 
We need Christians who can say, this is my lifestyle. I'm not turning back. I'm moving forward. If you, if you believe, shout hallelujah. So, think about people who says, I, we have died in faith. I have died. He didn't do all, but I knew that all, some things he did. And also I was facing chapter, but I will die in faith. I will die in faith. Look at the apostles who died in faith. Who died in faith. Last time I gave an example that if someone can come here with AK-57 and say, who's a Christian here? Who's a member of Charisse? All of you here. Some of you will enter under your chair. You'll find yourself under a chair here. I think I must organize one. <laughs> I, I just think I must organize one. And it, someone say, so you people, you say you're Christians, eh? And they, they are wearing baraklava. Eh? You'll be surprised. You'll be surprised Magogo is number one going out today. You'll be surprised someone is sleeping down here. He scattered the Bible. There. And then everybody's afraid of death. But when you reach apostles, they say, no, we are ready. What are you talking about? Paul says, I'm ready to be poured out like a drink. Ah, Peter said, me? Ah, you cannot crucify me like my, my Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, you can put me upside down. Ah, that's where boiled with oil. They say, enter here unless you stop. So another one would just say, sorry, say, I'm a Christian, but... I don't want to die. Say, please, I'll give you money. No, there's nothing to negotiate here. You need to stand your ground. Many of you, you are compromising in your stand. This is the time that when challenge hit, you stand like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and say, if God is not saving us, if God is not saving us, let it be known that we will never bow to this idol. So this is the time that we need to stand our grounds. Tell you somebody, say, make faith your lifestyle. Well, what are you facing? Can you ask your neighbor, what are you facing? And your neighbor say what? Well, my God. Colossians 2, verse 20. This verse is very much challenging. After you read this verse, you must tell someone that you don't have life. It says what, Mama? If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why as if you were still living in the world, do you submit to rules and regulations such as do not handle this, do not taste? Which verse are you reading, Mama? 20. Galatians. Okay. Read Galatians 2 verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. That is in him I have shared this crucifixion. It is no longer I who live but Christ lives in me. The life that I now live in the body, I live by faith, by adhering to relying and completely trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up, up. and gave himself up for me. Tell your neighbor you do not have life. Say you, you don't have life. Can you read that verse again, Mom? 20. I have been crucified with Christ. That is, in him I have shared his crucifixion. Yes. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith, by adhering to, relying on, and completely trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Are you hearing that verse? Are you sure you're hearing the verse? 
Read it again, Mama. I have been crucified with Christ. Uh -huh. That is in him I have shared his crucifixion. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith, by adhering to, relying on, and completely trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. To know that you have Christ in you is when you live by faith. Amen. That verse is telling us that to know that it's not what you talk and say, I've got Christ or you have got feelings. No. If you live by faith, Christ is in you. Amen. Because, I mean, in flesh, you live by faith. In spirit, Christ is in you. When you live by faith, don't forget that that will also come to remove Christ who is in you. If Christ is in you, will control the whole body of you. The ability of Christ must be your ability. The ability of Christ. If truly you are living by faith in your flesh, you will get ability of Christ. No wonder why Christ said, you know, if you believe in me, if you believe that I'm inside you, you will do what I've done. Even do above. If you believe that I'm inside you, or I'm with you, if you believe in me, what I've done, you will do also. You will even do above. Because you are living by faith. If you say in the name of Jesus, nothing happened. Check, are you living by faith? Who is in you? If Christ is not you, it is you yourself. You are alone. Christ must be in you. Amen. Galatians 3 verse 7. So understand that it is the people who live by faith with confidence in the power of and the power and goodness of God who are the true sons of Abraham. It's us today that my surname is changed from Makananisa to the same name of Abraham. It's, it's me, one time I, I tried to do that. I told my mother that, uh, you know, Abraham had some animals. Let me try to get more animals and see what will happen. I was shocked. I realized that we are not even trying to read about Abraham, our fathers. We can have the same results. When those animals, when I had some goats that I was given, I've never heard that a goat gave birth to five small goats. It was the first time for me to see that. Because, you know, I'm coming from a place in Venda where on our side there's, there's a desert. It's like desert. It's a dry place. But to find that this five, this one, three, this one, what I know, it's a, it's a pig. A pig doesn't care. But I found that everything was like multiplying. From today, the faith that we are having, not that is the same faith that Abraham was having. It makes you to be a friend of God. I say it makes you to be a friend of God. You know, this is the time that when God wants to do something, he must tell you. He must tell you. When God wanted to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, I said, no, we have to tell Abraham. Because Abraham is going to be big. Can you hear that? He's going to be big. Because you cannot have this kind of faith and remain small. You cannot have this kind of faith. The lifestyle you are starting, you'll be surprised you are overtaking people you think they are educated. People who think they've started business before you. People who think they are ahead in front of you. I don't know if you're hearing me. You'll be surprised by the faith I'm talking about. This faith, when you just have a, a bachelor degree, you find that you are, you are getting a lot of money from someone who's having 
above from someone who's having masters. And you are doing big things with a small money. And someone is getting big money, but is doing nothing. I want to tell you, I want to give you this word this week. That God is going to connect you and make you big. Yeah. Your faith will give fruits and results that are worthy. In the name of Jesus. How many of you today believe that Abraham is your father? Do you know that Isaac went to Gerar and he became rich and he became more rich and he be, until he became a very big man? Why are we poor today? Poverty is not your portion. I say poverty is not your portion. I say poverty is not your portion. Listen, if truly you are a child of Abraham, no, me, I don't want to use Macaranis again. You must, you, must, you must call me Apostle Abraham. Because look, look, this same name makes me to forget. This same name you have, it makes you to forget. But I will tell you why you have that same name. Can I tell you? Why you have that same name? Because he wants to raise you from that family. Let you be the first from that family. Yeah. Develop a lifestyle where you are different from there. And they see you living a life of understanding who is your God. Yeah. <sighs> Mama, how can we read this Bible about Abraham and the Bible says, I read that verse again, Mama, read that verse. I read it. Mm -mm. So the understand that it is the people who live by faith with confidence in the power and goodness of God, who Mama, are... St stop there. With confidence in the power mm. and goodness of God. Amen. Who are what? Who are the true sons of Abraham? Who are the true sons of Abraham? Who are the true sons of Abraham? Abraham, when he was told... Leave your family. Leave what what? Don't be surprised when sometimes family doesn't understand you. It's the same thing. When God began to choose you out of the family, it's not to say fight with the family. He wants to teach the family through you. You can't fight that family, but he wants to teach the family through you. There is a lesson that the family will learn, especially this year. I say especially this year. You are going to bear fruits that will remain in Jesus' name. Amen. You can lift up your hands and ask God to guide you in the generation that is starting with you in your life. He must guide you. Ask as a God in my family. You mentioned the same name. You mentioned your family that guide me. I want to be of the generation that fear God. Generation that will show God's power. Generation that will have a different lifestyle. Prayer. Pray that prayer. Pray that prayer. Pray that prayer. Pray that prayer. Ask God. Ask God. Ask God. Ask God. Generation. In other words, you are breaking a generational case. You are breaking a generational case. You are breaking a generational case. You are starting a generation that fear God. I'm starting a generation that works with God. I'm starting a generation that works with God. Generation. Begin to break generational case. Begin to break generational case. As you are praying that prayer. In my family, in my generation. In my generation.
In Jesus mighty name. Amen. Listen. In this generation of faith. Where faith is your lifestyle. I want to tell you something. There is nothing called. Prosperity gospel. Prosperity is your life. I don't know if you're hearing me. This is no prosperity gospel. Prosperity is what? It's your life. You are bound to prosper. You are, you are, the Bible says you are the head, you are not the tail. You, you, you are the first person to drive a car that you are driving. To stay in the house that you are staying. You are the head in your family. If you believe, say hallelujah. You, it's not... Listen, I'm saying it again. There's nothing called what? Prosperity gospel. Nothing like that. What, what is there is prosperity is, is your portion. Because you'll go to the land that is dry and you sow a seed, it will germinate. You'll enter a company. You'll be in a company where people are retrenched and you're not retrenched. Yeah. You find you are promoted. You'll be in a, in a place where you know there's no house, but there will be a house. So prosperity is part of you. Because of your lifestyle. Can you just lift up your hands for the last time? You begin to thank God about the life that is giving you right now. Prayer. Forget, cast out all these doubts. Thank God about the life that God is giving you in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. I'm a child. I'm a son of Abraham. I'm a son of Abraham. This is the life you are giving to me. I'm a son of Abraham. I'm a son of Abraham. In Jesus' name, amen.